Hancock. All right, our scripture this morning is going to come out of John chapter 15, and uh, we'll get through a bunch of it today. I'm not going to read it all here at first, but we're going to start in John chapter 15, verse 1. The heading there says, the vine and the branches. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does, that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love have no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, to love each other. <clears throat> Let us pray this morning. Father, we thank you again for the reminder, Lord, that we can be in you, Lord, and you in us. Sometimes we take for granted that, Lord, and, and we discount <clears throat> the power, Lord, that is in that. The fact that you dwell within us. Lord, what an amazing thing. What a blessing that is. Father, help us to understand that. Help us to understand what it is to lay down one's life. Lord, bring us that wisdom today. Help me to speak clearly and boldly for you this morning, Lord, as always. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Now, I pondered this week in, in just what I was to speak on, um, where I was to go in the Scriptures, and what the Lord wanted us to glean from His Word in our present time. And that's never an easy task from week to week anyways. And, and I pray most of the time that, that what I bring to each of you makes sense and takes you deeper into your relationship with Christ. I pray that it gives you a renewed desire to live faithfully and to seek his will for your life. After all, that, that is what God's word can and will do if we are in the word, if we are studying the word, if we are trying to live out what we learn in the word. It will convict you. It will inspire, motivate, encourage, and enlighten those who choose to study it. More importantly than all of them, and yes, more importantly, it will transform you and deliver you into that new life. One that mirrors the Savior, one that seeks His will, one that will, when the time comes, join Him in eternity. That is the power of the Word of God. Should we choose not to obey His commands, not to obey His Word, then He will have little use for us on the day of His return. <clears throat> I saw a quote the other day, and I apologize. I don't know. 
I couldn't find it. I remembered it, but then I could not find it again. So I, I don't, forgive me for not quoting who it was from, but it, I didn't write it. But, uh, and, it, and I thought this was satire at first, honestly, when I read it. Then I went back and I'm like, it's not. It's not. It says, why would you want to spend an eternity with Jesus in heaven if you don't want to spend any time with him now? And I thought, again, first I, I just glanced over it when I came upon it, and then I thought, wait a minute, that's a pretty bold statement. And it's a statement that, that's sobering as, I, as we reflect upon how the culture in general feels about God, how they feel about heaven. It, it's easy to say, hey, I'm going to heaven, or there is a heaven, or there's a way to get there, or this or that, but there's no other thought put into that. And what is required of us as followers of Christ to be there in order to, to get to that place he prepares for us. Many can say, I'm going, but few know how to get there. And few have time for the Savior who made it possible to get there. And yet they want to be in heaven. That, that was an interesting an interesting comment to come across. And, and I think partly the reason it fits is because we have somehow watered down what it is to follow Jesus. We've watered it down to the point where we've made it just a, a, a simple matter of prayer or a dunk in the water, and then we're good to go about our lives, much the way we had before. Only now we have a piece of paper that says we're baptized. If there's no discernible change in our life, after placing our, our faith in Christ as we claim upon that moment, that's very worrisome. Fortunately for us, God doesn't give up on us. But it's also a two-way street. And I remember having this, this conversation years ago with another pastor because, because at times somebody gets baptized Puts the, confesses their faith in Christ, and you never see them again. And it's not a going to church thing. It's a living as Christ thing. And he said, it's, it's a heart. It's, a, it's, it's what's in their heart. The Lord knows what's in their heart. Some are not ready when they think that they are. Or some are grasping at straws. If I, if I go through the motions, if I, if, I just, if I just get that part done, then I'm good. But the Lord does not give up on us. And I can attest to this as I thought about it. I can attest to this. I prayed a prayer to receive Christ. Thought, okay, I'm good now. That's what we were supposed to do. I was baptized. But it didn't change a lot at that moment. Now, I wasn't a bad person. I was a husband, a father. I held down a job. And, and still, it was as if I knew that that was something I needed to do, something, a step I was supposed to take, but I really didn't know what to do after that. Really didn't know. So I didn't, did nothing different for a while. I just went on with life for the most part. But as I said, God doesn't give up. And, and I'll get more into that as we get a little farther. But, but many of us are, get into that boat of taking those first steps, and then we're not listening for that guidance of the Holy Spirit. We're not listening to the changes He wants to make. We, we do. We jump back into life as we knew it and don't look for those, those opportunities to make a change, to pursue what it is to be Christ-like. Now, and as I said, I struggled with what, I, what to choose for a Scripture today, but but then one kept coming to mind this week, and no doubt because we're coming up on the anniversary of 9-11, which we celebrate, no, I don't know if you say celebrate, we remembered yesterday. And often in a time of great tragedy, a time of heroic acts, this particular verse seems to be one that is called upon a lot. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. 
the first and, and most obvious meaning of this verse is that there is no greater act of love than to lay down your life physically for your friend in order to save theirs. That's exactly what happened 20 years ago and in so many other times throughout the history of this country, in the history of the world, when ordinary men and women have been asked to stand as a first line of defense against all manner of evil. Some not necessarily volunteering it, but being thrust into a situation in which they had to react, and they did so with great courage. This is also exactly what happened when Jesus went to the cross obediently, knowing that it would be a painful, excruciating death. The fact, the act of obedience led to death was more that, that we think of it as that one act. Oh, he went to the cross. But this wasn't just a one act of obedience. It was a lifetime of obedience to the Father and to the leading of the Holy Spirit that led to the laying down of his life. Do you remember when Jesus prayed in the garden? Do you remember how distraught he was? Do you remember how he agonized over what was to come? Obedience and faithfulness to the Lord and his will, that's, that's not easy. It's not, he didn't take lightly what was about to happen. If we look at Matthew 26, we see an account of this. Matthew 26 in verse 36 to 42 says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and two sons of Zebedee along with him and began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And Jesus, Jesus isn't an exaggerator. He's, he's not going to claim it was one thing when it was not. And, and I don't think that any, maybe a few of us, but not many here could say that they've ever experienced such a feeling as Jesus was going through right now. To be agonizing over what was to come, as he said, to the point of death. Going a little further, he fell with his face on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup take, be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. He asked, is there any other way? Any way he would not have to do it this way. If there was any other thing, he wanted to know, is there another possibility? Now remember, he, he wanted the outcome because he knew what the outcome of this, this death was going to be. He loved creation. But he says, Father, if there is another way. Verse 40, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Then he went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. May your will be done. He understandably was in great agony over the looming crucifixion. If you read Luke's account, it says he was sweating drops of blood as he was praying in the garden. That is agony. If you've read some of the accounts of the the soldiers in World War II coming to Normandy Beach, it, there was accounts of that very thing of the, in the boats that were coming in, sweating drops of blood because they knew they were going in to an almost certain death situation. That is agonizing over what is to come. He was understandably in agony. 
not just about the looming crucifixion, but also about the separation from the Father that he was going to have to endure because he was to take our shame upon himself on the cross. Knowing this, having pleaded for another way, he said, may your will be done. That is faithfulness. That is righteousness. That is what it is to follow Christ, to to know the outcome, to know the hurt, to even have prayed that it might not happen, that there might be another way. And yet when it becomes clear that it's a must to do it anyways, not for our glory, but for God. Jesus Christ, in the perfect example of laying down one's life for their friends, he is the example. Now, there are brave men and women around the world that have done this very same thing, for laid down their lives to protect their loved ones, to protect their friends, to protect perfect strangers they they, they don't know. But they did so that we might live, so that we might enjoy the freedom, and not become victims of the evil that's in the world. And still, there's another part to this Scripture. There's another understanding of it. You see, we have that physical explanation, the physical part of Jesus actually going to the cross, of laying down his life, and of men and women around the world doing the same, But then there's a spiritual aspect to this piece of Scripture as well. Something we need to understand as followers of Christ. You see, there's there's that physical part, but what about the spiritual? We are called to lay down our lives in that manner as well. If we truly want to obey the Word of God, if we want to obey His command... If we truly want to emulate Christ, we have to lay down our life spiritually as well. He did the same, not only dying on the cross, but also resisting sin and temptation, foregoing the pleasures of this world so that the, the Father's will could be accomplished through him. And that, that's what makes him an awesome Savior. The fact that he came, he endured temptation. He endured hardship. He endured persecution. But he denied himself and obeyed the Father. Went through with the plan even though he knew what was coming. This is our focus for today. How can we do that? How can we lay down our lives? It may not be necessarily in a physical manner, although in some places around the world it is. In Afghanistan right now, there are Christian men and women who are going to lay down their lives. Some have. Because they want to be an attorney, because they will not deny the name of Jesus Christ. I don't even know, it's to the point over there now, I don't know if they give them the opportunity. That used to, in some countries, that's it. That's what they want. They want you to deny Christ. But they won't do it. This, these verses this morning, words of Jesus himself, reflect upon what it is to be one with the Father. And in, and in doing so, laying down one's life. To be one with the Father, we have to lay down our life. Or the lives, the lives that the world tells you you need to have. He said in the beginning of, verse, of chapter 15, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Even more. You, some of you have seen that. If you've driven by some of the driven, I shouldn't have said driven, sorry. <laughs> if you've driven by some of the bigger orchards, I know down at Route 14, um, down below Canton, you can see it well because they're close to the road, when they prune in like February, and there is, there's a ring of branches around them trees, just piled. I mean, some of them are, are piled that high, just dead branches. And it's obviously they're not going to produce fruit anymore. 
but come by in July, and those trees are loaded with apples because they have not only cut off the bad ones, they have pruned the ones, even the ones that were giving some fruit. It's the same with us. He's going to cut out those who no longer produce fruit. And he's going to prune even those of us who are trying, who are producing some fruit. He's going to prune us so that we can learn, so that we can move forward and become closer to him, be more, have more wisdom with which to reach somebody. If we move down a little bit, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. If we stay in the vine, if we're one of the ones that are left, attached to the vine, attached to Christ. But he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like the branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. He said, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. To lay down our lives each day, to be obedient to the word of God, will produce in us fruit. Apart from him, we can do nothing. We're, we are like the branch that has been pruned and withers away. Any of you do have gardens or shrubs or anything that gets pruned, you know what that looks like. You know how quickly those branches can wither. They become dry, brittle, and slowly, if they are not burned, they rot away quickly. No fruit or seed ever comes from them again. But if just a few small little sprouts are trimmed off, a few little branches, the plant will flourish, will produce double the fruit because of that pruning. When we as followers of Christ willingly lay down our lives, we offer them up to the Lord to be pruned. We grow immensely. We allow ourselves to be used by him and to produce fruit through believing. Sorry, I messed up. But we produce fruit through obedience, through being open to the Spirit's leading. Because we lay down our lives, others are able to see Christ in us. Others are able to benefit from whatever it is Christ decides to do through us. When we refuse to lay down our lives, when we refuse to submit to the Lord's calling on our lives, we we don't look any different than the rest of the world. We end up producing little fruit and portraying our, our Savior as incapable of changing anyone. This happens when when what people see in the church is no different than what they see everywhere else. And then their view of God becomes skewed because they're assuming either he doesn't exist or he can change that person because they're no different. Back to verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus says, you are my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because servants, a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Remain in my love. He didn't say, you are in my love now, so your work is done. Go kick back and take it easy. 
didn't say that. No, he said to remain in his love. Jesus remained in the Father's love by keeping his commands, and now he is telling us that to remain in his love, to keep his commands. His command? His command is to love one another as I have loved you. And then right after that, and there's no accident that they're together, right after that, love, love one another as I have loved you, then greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one friend. He's explaining, this is what I'm doing for you. Do the same. So what is, what, how are we to do that? What does it look like? What would we look like as followers of Christ if we obeyed this very command. Well, for one, we would be set apart. Apart from the world, apart from sin, apart from evil. We would be set apart and standing out. Now, don't don't mistake that with today's version of standing out. Today's version of standing out from the world's perspective is to put yourself ahead of everything else, to put yourself before everything else. Because Look at today's, and I'm, I'm not knocking selfies. If you want to take a selfie, whatever. But, but when we want to show somebody something today, is the, when the world wants to show what's going on or show credit for something, they have to put themselves in front of whatever's going on. Even to the point of helping somebody, of doing a generous thing, of doing something to, to help somebody in need. Oh, let me be in the picture. Let me, let me get this angle so that they see me doing it. So they see what I have done. We are to be set apart. And, and to stand out is to stand out because we are set apart. Not, we gain a, not to gain attention or fame or to be recognized as different. But we will be noticed as different. It will be noticed that we are guided by love, that, that we are not willing to go along with the craziness of the world. We're not to shun people. We're not, not condemning them either. All the while, we're not endorsing sinful behavior or taking part of it in ourselves. It's complicated, and it's hard. But we have to stop seeking worldly approval, stop caring what they think about the church. We have to stop wanting everything that everyone else in the world wants. He will provide for those who are in him. And and we need to learn to let that be enough, to let ourselves be content with it. Most of all, we need to understand that to follow Christ, to lay down our lives means that the world will not understand. In fact, they'll hate us for it. Judging by the way the church in America blends into the world, we are not doing a very good job at laying down our lives. We are in danger of being pruned, and not just pruned, but cut off to wither. Verses 18 to 25, a little lower than what we read this morning, the title says, The world hates the disciples. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, your servant, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted you, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. If they treat you this way because, they will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law They hated me without reason. If the world hates you, keep in mind they hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. 
as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Now, I told you earlier, when I prayed to receive Christ, I didn't, I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. I, I didn't understand what to do next or what was to happen. But the Lord in his persistence did not give up on me. He pursued me. Through a great loss, I looked to him for comfort. Soon, my every thought was about the scriptures, about truth. I devoured the word and and sought to understand what it is he wanted from me in this life. These scriptures that he, what he, I just, I didn't know what he wanted. And I wanted to know. I wanted to understand I wanted to know what he wanted us to get out of them. What what, what was the outcome he was looking for? If we love one another as he loved us, the world will hate us for it. All because we claim to do all this in his name. Yet, after following his teaching, even to the point of preaching the gospel every week, sharing the word of God almost every day through some form of technology, I am made aware that there is so much more that can be done. So I have to ask myself, and we all have to ask ourselves, have we truly laid down our life? Have we as the church done this, or are we worried about fitting in? Are we, are we truly loving one another as Christ loved? I don't know, I don't feel that I am, and I I don't say that to to make myself sound bad either, but to, to understand that we have room to grow, that we are never fully mature in understanding the gospel. We are never all the way there until we get to go be with him. This is a constant lifelong learning experience. As we mature, we learn. As we mature, we understand more what it is to follow him, what it is to lay down our lives, what it is to love one another as he loved us. If we are blending into the world, we have a problem. And, and I know that too because I, being that I work two jobs, I am here and I am in the world. And it is really easy to let the two blend together. But they shouldn't. That, it's not an excuse, it's an example. It is easy to let happen. So this is my question for us all this week as we go from here today. Does the world hate us? It may sound like a strange question, but do they? Do they hate the church? Do you stand apart from it enough to stand out for Christ? And I don't mean you got to go thumping your Bibles, beating on everybody's door. That's not what it's about. Many of us in this area have somebody who visits and knocks on our door occasionally. Knock on wood, I haven't seen him in a little while. If we are bearing fruit for Christ, there is going to be resistance from the world. If we lay down our lives, if everybody loves you, We should reevaluate that. We should ask ourselves that question again. If we lay down our lives in order that we might stand out for Christ, it will not be in vain. I promise you that. We'll stop there for this week and ponder that question this week. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this week, Lord, for the reminder of what your son did, how he laid down his life, Lord, physically, Lord, spiritually. He was here. He was in the flesh, Lord. He he went through temptations just as we do. But he denied himself, Lord. He stayed obedient to your word, to your commands, Lord. And he went through doing your will, Lord, because he knew it had to be done, even if it was hard, even if it was terrifying. And Lord, he, he, he asked, Lord, we think there's something wrong with asking. There's nothing wrong with asking. Hey, is there another way to do this? But when there was not, he still obeyed. He still followed you. 
Lord, I think of those thrown into the fiery furnace that said, our God can deliver us. And even if he doesn't, we're not doing it your way anyways. Help us, Lord, to examine ourselves, to examine our lives and our relationships and the reactions we get from the world, Lord. Lord, fill us with your spirit that others may see it. Lord, that it may be a light, that it may attract those who are seeking you out. I praise you for this in advance, Lord, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.